Uh -huh. All right, folks, welcome to the last day of the bioinformatics and genomics regular workshop series. We will be putting out some more in the future coming. Uh, but uh, for today, I would like to first thank you all for hanging in all the way until the end. It's been a rough eight weeks, but it's been fun as well, trying to find all of the information to present and uh, putting it all together for, for you. Um, today, we're going to be talking about ML flow. In the past, we talked about the importance of pipelines and the, the emergence of um, the use of AI ML in bioinformatics. And therefore, today I wanted to mention a tool that is extremely powerful and extremely useful in order to, uh, well, run machine learning um, pipelines, not only in bioinformatics, but throughout uh, the world of uh, science. To help us with this, I'm not an expert on the topic, is Artin Majdi. And I'm going to let him walk through what the uh, uh, MLflow is. Before I hand it over to him, I wanted to point out that you can find all of our information, all of the content in our uh, GitHub Wiki. And if we scroll down, we can see what today's topic is right here in the link. Sorry, right in this link. I'm going to sh copy and paste this in the chat as well so that people may find it easier to access. Um, once again, thank you all for being here. And without any further ado, please let uh, please join me in welcoming Artin to today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Let me, I need to run something. Oh, I can do this, I guess. Oh, you need to let me share my screen. Yeah, sure. Just a second. Yeah. Try again. Uh, Jeff, I cannot uh, make him co-host. Can you make him co-host? Try sharing. Ask him to share. Share your screen. Yeah. Yes, it works. Okay then. Hello everyone. No, Michelle went through. I'm pronouncing your name correctly, right? It's Michele. it's Michele, but Michelle also works. <laughs> Sorry. Michele. So that Michele uh, uh, went through like the uh, bigger picture of the what is MLflow. Uh, MLflow is a powerful machine learning framework. It's used for managing the life cycle of your machine learning project from tracking all the parameters you used to what sort of data set pipeline you have used, what part of you the code, the packages you've installed, the version of the packages, everything will be in one place. And it helps organize the research workflow. So just for example, this is a, a experience that for researchers, you've all probably had this before. You are working on a paper. You have to run multiple experiments. You need to find out the, let's say you're using neural network. You need to find out the architecture you want to use or the model. Are you going to use some classification model on secular or something else or what type of classification? And after that, you need to run those models on your data set multiple times to optimize and tune your parameters for that model. Then you need to, before that, you need to pre-process the data 
And so ideally you will create a pipeline that would specify how to process the data. And when you're done with this, then it comes the experimentation phase, which you need to run different experiments with these models. And then when you're done with everything, you start writing your paper. Six months goes, you submit the paper, you get some reviews, some feedback from the reviewers, then you need to give me this other image. A lot of times, if you're not organized, you would, you would have a very hard time finding the exact model that was used for what you need today to replicate some results for the reviewers, for example, or for yourself or your professor, and you have a new PhD student that wants to continue the work of your previous student. And in order for the new student to uh, bring in the loop with everything, it would be a huge hassle. Frameworks like MLflow tries to mitigate these issues and make your life easier, essentially. It has various uh, features. It could be used for experiment tracking, which is probably going to be the most utilized for most of us in academia. It is platform uh, independent or agnostic, which means that when you have the model, you can save it in a certain type that then you can run. For example, you could train a model with Keras and then run it with PyTorch or with Secular and then run it with something else. Or if you work in Linux, but your friend works in Windows and the other friend work in Mac, with MLflow, you can overcome the challenges of going from one environment to the other. You would still have a lot of is some issues with installing the packages as there are some dirty work that unfortunately still you have to take care of. But without it, you would have a much harder time. Without it, you need to know exactly which packages to install and all of that. But with MLflow, ideally, you can just run one line of code and it'll install everything you need and show you the results. Like you want to share this with Revere or with your PI or somebody, you just give them the link to how to run from the model registry and ideally everything should work. But it's not 100% perfect, life's not perfect. From personal experience, there are still some hassles that you need to uh, take into account. For working with uh, ML projects, at least in the UA, you have various options. You can use HPC, you can use Cybers, or if you have some GPU in your lab, you can use those. Or if you have a strong PC, you might end up using that. Or if you're not working necessarily with terabytes of data sets, your data bits that are smaller, maybe you're just using your laptop. So the machine can be anything. In my experience, when I was a PhD student, sometimes I would, I would use all of these, like go from one to another. And if I wanted to recreate my environment and everything in each of those, it would be a nightmare. Then for data analytics, you might end up use, using various different packages. You could use SQLearn, uh, Nibobble, Pandas, or for database, you could use SQL, Postgres. Uh, the, the great thing about MLflow is that because it's open source, there is a very huge community that keeps adding to this uh, framework. And so many of the things, if not almost all of the things that you utilize for your data analysis, if you're a data scientist, biologist, engineer, it's probably uh, covered by MLflow. It doesn't cover the data set management, keep that in mind but you can save your data set pipeline as which is usually code as part of the parameter tracking. And the other benefits of it is that when we want to collaborate, if we're not a team of one, we usually adopt GitHub, Bitbucket, things like that to work around the collaboration work, the part. 
if you utilize ML flow, then you have you add multiple other layers on top of the simple push and pull on like GitHub, for example. Because in then suddenly the PI or the person at the top have access to all the changes that is made by each uh, developer or each scientist and know exactly what's happened and then can decide whether incorporate that into the entirety of the project or not. But MLflow obviously is not the only one. Uh, there were, there are, there exist other frameworks by the private companies. Facebook had a VLearner. There's the existing one got a few years old, so they might have newer uh, models. I haven't updated that part. Like Uber had Michelangelo. Even MLflow was for Databricks. And the bad, the disadvantage of utilizing those, for example, the Google TFX or the Facebook if learning or Amazon or whatever, is that you are limited to their platform. Like if you want to use Google TFX, you have to use uh, Google Cloud or same with AWS. And sometimes they don't give you all the algorithms to, you have to use their own algorithm or like your clustering part problem or things like that. But because Databricks decided to open source ML flow, now suddenly we don't have those issues. It's community run and we don't need to be afraid that we might lose access or we might not have the freedom that we need in an academic environment. MLflow has five components, which I went through the tracking mostly. I say the tracking is recording the experiments configurations. You some of your result to the extent that it's not too huge. Like it's not a terabyte, it's just an image, for example, or a small Excel file. Your code, exact code that was used to run that experiments. Like if you're using GitHub, you might end up having thousands of commits. But with this, then you know exactly that figure was created by that specific git hash or that specific commit from the GitHub and utilize that. Then the other component is models, which there is a space that you can save your model and decide or uh, put your best model inside the model registry. And so everyone could access that. The model itself saves the config for the model, which I'll show some details of how that works. It's just a simple a few lines of code. This says this what what was used, what what were some of the parameters for that model? And then model registry is where you deploy that model, whether for yourself, your team, or you want to share that link publicly with everyone. Although with model registry, then it'll become a little bit more complicated. Because if you want it to be public, you need to have server and then someone needs to take care of that part for you. There is a project aspect which helps make your project reproducible. Project is where it saves what sort of packages and what version of those packages was used to run those experiments. And uh, a few other things, for example, if you're using uh, virtual environment managers like you know, Anaconda, you can uh, put your Anaconda file requirement files in that, and then whoever wants to utilize your model can just run those. And then there's a plugin which can create apps. For the tracking, uh, oh, I'm skipping through this. Uh, I already explained that. You can save your artifacts, meaning models. You can save metrics, accuracy, AUC, parameters, and you can add tags. What was the source? For example, you can uh, GitHub or uh, local. And then you can also version it. In order to do the tracking, it's very fairly straightforward. For example, this is a Python code. You want to, let's say, log your epochs in your neural network. You can just write mlflow.logpran, or if it's a metric, log metric or if you want to log the model, like say, or for a lot of frameworks, MLflow has the auto log feature. Like for Keras, it does have that. For Secular, it does have that. 
that you can just put that and then it'll lock all the typical parameters from your Keras model, not everything obviously, all the things that is typical of your model. And then you can add other parameters and metrics on top of that. As I said, it works with various different uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, Keras, R, but you can utilize Docker too. You don't have to use like the just the typical like the virtual environment managers and Spark and many other things. The MLflow project component that I mentioned is this. Just it's a one file which you specify the for example, my env.yaml is the file that contains all the requirements for the packages. If you have a Docker environment, you can include the image of the Docker environment. And then any other uh, entry points, if you wanted that project to be run in a certain way, for example. For model registry, uh, you can either use code to create a registered model, or you can, the uh, uh, UI is much more straightforward. I'll show how to do that. You can go to UI and specify which model is in which stage of your project um, for everyone to utilize that. Then for the server, if you're using uh, MLflow on your local machine, you, you don't, it's very straightforward. You can do everything on your local machine have all the files saved there, but then you don't get some of the benefits of being portable. So you instead you can have some server, for example, on Cybers, and use Postgres, SQL, or whatever database uh, that code that you, you like, you prefer. And so all the tracking metrics, params, artifacts will be saved there. And the artifact doesn't have to be in the same place as the URI or other metrics. It could be two different servers. For example, you can put the artifacts on S3 buckets on AWS if you prefer so, because those tend to be a lot bigger in size. For artifact storage, as I mentioned, or you could use uh, HPC too. You can use SFTP to save your artifact inside HPC or atmosphere environment in cybers or data storage. The, these two are also a little bit older, but I assume you still have the option to utilize those, or you can just use the local. And when you're creating, you're setting your experiments, you can specify the location to the artifact. For example, if it's local, you just need to put file, uh, colon and then dash the path to that uh, directory or if it's or if you're utilizing sftp put the sftp or if it's utilizing something else like x3 uh, then I, I i don't think i have all the options here unfortunately but there are like multiple different ways that you can uh, talk to your server So I think we kind of went already through some of the benefits of MLflow in academic research. Obviously, it makes our research reproducible, which is very important uh, in our field of work. It makes the project management more efficient. Well, we, we've all wasted a lot of time, especially if you're working with a lot of programming on just setting up the environment and all the nitty gritty and all the things that comes from simply not being able to be fully organized. But MLflow can help with those. It, it helps you with the meta documentation to with, which will be very helpful down the line, especially if you want to get back and access your results there. And then also res result traceability. So for the, uh, this is almost the end of the presentation. I'm going to show you some code to how to utilize MLflow. The, for the data set that I use for this is breast cancer classification. Your, this is all imaginary, by the way. So the data set is not imaginary. It's 569 samples, 30 features. I hope those numbers are correct. Yes, 
I was playing with multiple different data sets. I think it was it is just one the latest one I'm utilizing. And a research team, let's say in this universe, you have a PI, you have a, 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 some PhD students from in engineering department and a biologist from the College of Health, College of Medicine. The, the technical stack for this specific project, I'm using Python 310. You don't, you can use anything you want, but keep in mind the lower you go, some MLflow version might not be, might not work with that version of Python. And the lower you go, obviously MLflow, then more noisy be, becomes. It's better to use the latest version. I think the, the latest version worked with 310, so that would be good. And then I'm using Learn for the classification, Panda for data processing, and Matplotlib and Seaborn for the visualization. For tracking server, I'm using local. I skipped the Postgres part in the Atmosphere VM to make it easier. Also for artifact storage, I skipped the Cyrus part because a lot of you might not need to do any of those things. Local might be enough for you because maybe your team of one, you know. And for, well, I guess we have, I've already gone through some of the challenges, so I'll skip this. Uh, one of the downfalls of MLflow before we get to the code is, as I said, is the data set. It doesn't manage the data set itself, but it does, it, you can input the data pipeline. For example, you have 10 lines of code to pre-process the data in a certain way, you can save that, but not the data set itself. And then, um, I guess these are fine. Let's go through the actual code. I don't know how many people want to follow me on this, but we have multiple routes. Let me reshare the screen. So one way is, this is the GitHub repo for uh, uh, this project. So uh, I assume everyone have access to this. And then inside the MLflow folder, you can ignore a lot of these, these are the artifacts that was created when I was running the code. This is all you need, the bioinformatic ML flow. You can run this on Colab. I created Colab for you. You can just need to click on this. Sorry, I didn't want it. And then duplicate this for yourself and follow me when we'll be running this. Or if you want to utilize the code spaces, you can click on code and then code spaces. Then if you don't have RDF1, create one, and then just run that. Or you can utilize Cybers. I assume you've already gone through most of these and then the current environment. And if you go inside the apps, there should be a Jupyter Lab Bioscience. Um, I don't know if I should create another one and use my old one. So you can run that request. Well, let me show you these two steps in case. Then you can request CPU memory, whatever you want. And then run, run it. I already have one, so I'm not going to create another one. I think this was the one I was using. Well, I guess I'm not allowed to utilize that anyway. So uh, it doesn't matter which of these you follow me whether it is the code space or collab. Um, why is the screen is shared, right? Yeah, we can see your screen. 
Okay, then. And you see they have collab and stuff, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. We can see collab. Okay. Yeah, for some reason, it doesn't have that green box anymore. So it doesn't matter which one you used. All of them should work. There is one small nuance when you're running in the DE, which I'll mention that when I go through that. Anyway, so, or you could download this uh, Jupyter Notebook or the whole repo on your local machine and follow us there. So the only thing that you need to do, I've already done that once in that code space, but you need to install MLflow, Pandas, SQLearn, and NumPy. If you want to use it directly through Jupyter Notebook, you can add the exclamation mark and just, just run it. And all will work. Because I've done it, I don't need to do that again. And then you import whatever packages you want to use for your project plus MLflow. So for example, ML, so ML desk, SQL, and if you're using Keras, you could use the Keras too. So let's run that. And I'm loading the breast data set from the SQL and data sets. So I use that so that you don't have to download any files. That's why I was playing with multiple different data set. And I assume everyone is familiar with pandas too. So I'm not going through the details of those too much. Just very briefly, PD is my panda data for data package. And I am converting the data set into a data frame so that I can take advantage of Panda features. And then this is the database. This is the first five row of the database. And this is some of the description of the data set, which if you're interested, you can look into later. So let's say we want to do some classification right now. Okay? So we do the typical separate train and test normalize it and do a bunch of other normalization stuff to give us the train and test data set. Now that we have our data set, this is essentially our data set pipeline, which I was talking about. Now we need to create our first experiment. For MLflow, you can do mlflow.create experiment but the problem with that is that it would work the first time, but from then, every time you run it, it will tell you that this experiment already exists. You can do the easier ones, which would work with the latest versions of MLflow, which just use set. When you do set, it checks if that experiment exists. It just loads that. If it's not, creates a new one. So let's run that. If you're following on the uh, cyber discovery environment, you need to include this line. This is the tracking UI for the registry I was talking about. File is because we're using local. Uh, it could be a FTP or it could be Postgres or whatever. We don't need, need that in local and uh, code space and collab. It works fine with those. So we're fine there. Now we want to run our experiments, right? So this is the function that runs our experiments. We are running a random class for a random forest classifier. If fit that model classifier on the train data, and then predict the results for the test data set, and also calculate the probability on top of the logits that we just measured. Then we are calculating accuracies, RCAC. And essentially, this is the, the main training aspect of our project. And then we also are plotting some confusion metrics for this. So in order to incorporate MLflow into this, you can just simply put uh, with mlflow.start run at the beginning of your code. Or you could also do it this way. And, but it's not. It is more Pythonic to use with, because when you don't, then you have to always make sure you're closing the run that you just started. But if your your code like crashes, then 
it doesn't get closed and then it's just not very it's messy so it's not pythonic to always use MLflow to with and then MLflow that start running you can put some other information too like run id run name run id is if you want to rerun the existing experiment if you don't include it then it will just create a new run for you but you can also include a name for that or if you have multiple experiments set, you can specific the, specify the uh, experiment too, I think. And in case of nested runs, let's say you have 10 simulation you want to perform under each of those simulation, you, have, you want to try multiple different parameters, you can do nested runs. And then in those case, you need to specify the pad, parent run ID. But we're not doing any of those, we keep it simple. So we do that. And then we are logging the number of estimators and maximum depth for our random force because we're running multiple of these. We're doing a for loop. We're doing 50, 100, 150 number of estimators and five and 10 for the depth of our trees. And then do the rest. So I, again, you could do the ML4 dot auto log for the second line too, but uh, I'm not doing that here, but you can do that too. I wanted to show you all the details that so we could save it uh, manually. Then I'm logging. So here I log the parameters. Here I'm logging the metrics, accuracy, ROC. And then here I'm logging the model, the train model. And then another, after this, I'm you know, printing, uh, plotting the confusion matrix. So I save that as an artifact and then close the plot, which that's not necessarily. So let's run this. So while this being run, you can go to your terminal and go inside the MLflow folder. If you do ls-l, you would see that, or you can see it here, I guess. See, there is a, there's a, uh, there should be a folder called ML runs created in your, uh, tra the, wh whatever you specified here. If you didn't, it would be the same folder as before, where the tracking URI. So this is why the ML runs, you could put something else, but the default is ML runs. And then inside that, it saves all the parameters and everything. So in your terminal or in the Jupyter Notebook works too, if you go inside the folder where the ML run exists and do ML flow UI, it'll create a server for you to see what you just created. So let me close this. But uh, this is our MLflow server, essentially. This is the experiment we just created. I had some more experiments from before. Or, so these are one from before. And these are the new one that we just created. And inside each of these, because it was a for loop, and each of these was one experiment. If you go, you see you have number of estimator, maximum depth, accuracy, ROC. You have small metrics, system metrics, and artifacts. Inside the artifact, ML model is the MLflow project that I mentioned, which it has your model saved as a pickle. It has the Python version. It has the your environment, your packages, the UID for this run or simulation. And you could also include other information later if you wanted to. Then all the packages we used, for example, 211 version of NumPy, the model, the pickup model. Well, this is, I guess, uh, this is the environment manager, right? That's for the plugins, mostly. And it created both of them just in case, I guess, both the, um, Conda if you're using Anaconda and just pip to make it easier for you. And this is the confusion metrics that we created. 
for each of those simulations. So you can do a bunch of other things later. For example, you want to compare these three experiments. You can do compare and you can look at the, because we're using same parameter, so it's all the same, but when you actually utilize it, you would have a lot more parameters, more complicated, and you can compare the uh, different experiments to pick the best model for you. So let's go back to our experiment. So now we set the ML flow experiment, we run our simulation, we saved everything using ML flow. But you can do a lot more after that too. For example, we can search using code through all the runs. And like this, this few lines of code, for example, shows you all the experiments that has been run. The first column is the run ID, and then the parameters, accuracy, AUC. These are the things that I'm asking for. You can ask anything else too. Or you can uh, use those, the, the existing simulations and plot some figures here too, to compare the different experiments. Or the best, I guess, uh, case scenario, the one of the cool applications of this is you can search through all the metrics and pick the best model, load it. And now, so let's say you run this a week ago and you, it takes a long time. So you keep, you keep it, you let it run for different parameters for a week. After a week, you simply open ML flow, run a few codes to just look at the metrics and load the best model, the, the one with most accuracy, I guess, in this case, and then do the simulation, the, uh, do the anal actual analysis using that model, right? Right now, we're looking through all of those and we're taking the best one. The here I'm assuming is a, the, fir the first one is the best one, but you can obviously, this is a panda, so you can easily sort the space on that column. And so the high, the first row is the most accurate one, or you can find, or there are like an infinite ways to, not infinite, but there are multiple ways to pick which row is the model you're looking for. And then just run, continue your analysis on that model. But the, the other things that you could do, there are a lot more, but I've brought some that would be more useful here. You see the names, these are the run names. They were all generated randomly. But what if you want to have your own name? So in this case, I'm taking the best model that I just picked here and rename it to something that I want to like best model one. For that, I simply run it with MLflow star run again, but this time I specify the run ID, which I picked from here, and then set the mlflow.run name tag to my new name. So let's run this. Now, if I go back here and refresh, you would see that, see, oh, that it picked this one, I guess. This is from the older one. If this one was the best model, so you rename it to this one, and then we can go inside and access the artifacts and so on, so. Or you could you run more experiments, same as renaming the experiment, the, the experiment, you can run more like data analysis on an existing run. Again, same concept. You specify the run ID, you load your model. This one, because was secure learn, I'm using secure learn, but you could, and you're not limited to this. And then like here, I'm writing, I'm printing the histogram, for example. I think we have a question. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Okay, Michael. <laughs> Oh, I love mics. Um, my question is, uh, okay, so you are in code spaces, right? Is that what you're showing right here? Yeah, this is code spaces. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, 
the tab that says ML flow. flow. How, how, yeah, that, where did that come from? So, so I, went I went to the to terminal. The and uh, I don't have ter a terminal in, in, um, I'm in collab, so I can't actually do uh, that. You, you can instead do this, but the problem with Jupyter is that you need to create uh, another cell and just do exclamation mark and we'll flow our UI. If you run this, it'll create the same thing. The problem with, let me just do that right now. Let me close the uh, terminal one. The problem with this is that it will continue running. And so you you might have a hard time running other cells. For some reason, it didn't work here. But if you run this, you should do the same thing, essentially. For some reason, my code space restarted itself. ML flow UI. Yeah, and then exclamation mark. Can right, so, so it becomes a shell command. And then no. when... It gives you a link, same as the terminal that it gave me a link. You see in the terminal, in, oh, I think close space crashed. Okay, thank you. I understand that. Appreciate it. Yeah, so it give, this is the link. Being one to, and then when you click on it, it'll open this tab, which essentially has everything. If it was local machine, it would be 127.0.0.1. But because it, this is some, like, this Microsoft server, that's Google server, they have to mm, open some ports and you, there would be a different link. I don't know how can I go back to what I was doing. I'm wondering if code spaces have a timer because it seems like it. Code spaces have a timer, but only if they detect that you're not using it. Um, mm -hmm. It might just be that you ran out of uh, memory or something. Well, I can open it again, I guess. Oh, I think my internet is having some issues. Seems like. Can you continue that in the collab too? Like, let me run everything here. I didn't know that MLflow actually had like the functionality that uh, you can see which one is the best model. That's really useful. Yeah, well, it has the metrics, so you need to pick the best one. But yeah, but especially when you have to let your model run for like weeks, this would be very hand handy. Oh yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, for people using any of these, like this is like right now I'm installing all those packages. I said like for the code space, I didn't run it because I had already done it. But Colab, it seems like it restarted itself too. So I have to run it again. So now let's do the whole thing. Yeah, code space, it doesn't detect good kernel now. I had some issues before too. It has some bugs in their server. Let me close this. And go over to where before. Interesting. It's so much slower. So now that I'm running this again, when we 
load the ML flow server again, we would see that there are like 10 more of what or six more experiments now because we ran, we created six more experiments. But now you're running in Colab, right? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. I'm also, so that, that's the beautiful beauty oh. of oh, although, so that No, you're right. That's a good point. If we had, we're using a server, remote server, it didn't matter. It would connect to the same server and we could see whether we start there now here, but we're not using the remote server. We're using local thing. Like you see, it has its own ML run, which is, this is connected to GitHub, but it's not syncing automatically. Like you have to pull and push. So you can kind of like set it up on a separate server and it will always track any experiments or models that you're trying to run. Yeah. Like That's if you want cool. to use a HPC, you won't be able to run it on a HPC. You need to have your own separate server. Like that's what I was doing, for example, during my PhD. Oh, yeah. I had a server in Cybers and then running simulation in HPC. And so let's, let's try this right now in Outflow UI. You see, it created a link. It's not working. Oh, it was working. Maybe I, I thought it was working before. I guess in, in Colab it doesn't. Maybe it's... Um... Like this isn't the problem, the collapse. So it didn't create this link. Yeah. For me. You will have to do a uh, collab plus, but who's got money for that? Oh yeah, I I, I didn't check that. And the last time I had used collab was like two years ago. Yeah, if you but, click on the bottom left side, it says uh, that you can access terminal, bottom left. But it doesn't, it has, it's not about <laughs> it's the terminal money. link, right? This link part is a local link but local to the Google server. Yeah. It's a link to local to us. So they need to like connect some ports now. So let me, hopefully we can do it again here. Did that work? No. Well, I can just go through the, what I was going to show. We won't see the ML flow for showing. I can do that with my local machine too. I'll, I'll do that later. So I'm doing the same thing. Well, you remember what I was talking about the width, like instead of doing width and for star run, you can do the typical one, which is not very Pythonic, run equal to for that star run, then do the same exact things and then more pictures and save those as artifacts inside the workflow. Again, same here. But when you do this, you need to end your run all the time. You need to make sure that you're ending your run. Otherwise, it won't work. Should Why I? Why is that? Because it's, it's like anything else in Python and I'm sure other programming languages too. When you open, like you want to use Keras or all those things too, you have to always, when you, when you do mlflow that start run you're opening that simulation and it just keeps listening for new artifacts to be saved got you and it doesn't know when it's supposed to end it until you tell it that okay i'm done with this work today understood why well, is i'm here i guess i shouldn't well, I, I can't fix this or we can end it here because I, I don't think there's much more I can show on the MLflow UI. I think I already went through everything. We can end it here. I think this was a good show of the power that MLflow can give you, especially with being able to select the best model. Um, and also the UI interface is extremely helpful. Yeah. Uh, for some, I don't know why it's at Colab supported this link too, but I guess it didn't. They decided that making money is more important. <laughs> I, I don't know if that would fix it though. Term, it's not a terminal problem, is it? No, it, it's oh. probably because Colab doesn't allow for another window to be opened, I think. Oh, the pro version uh, does? Yeah, I think so. Then no, you know, I missed the presentation. <laughs> and oh. you're muted. <laughs> I just came to see how Artin's doing, so I'll watch the video.
Well, how have are you a doing, Arjun? for you. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing good. So, yeah. So, did we get the flow of ML flow solved for the campus? We almost did. And then the last five minutes, Microsoft decided to not let us use code spaces. <laughs> what? But but we went through everything. I think that's I just need to maybe create another a new workspace. That should be fine. Yeah, you you the idea will what I do when code spaces fails is I just delete it and open up a new one and it works again. So well the, when you do that, you need to reinstall the packages. Yeah, and that's annoying. And in my case, because I was I'm syncing my GitHub too with inside code space, but because you need to log in and sync again. It will require like five ten minutes because I did that this morning. This is the first time that happened to me. I think code space is becoming like the old windows where you have to reboot and reinstall to like yeah. after you put so many packages, it it's out. It's like no more installation. And it's timer is weird too. Like we were working on the notebook, but for some reason, this timer decided, oh, they're not working. <laughs> It's because it's a live demo, so obviously, if the text is a live demo, it's gonna break. <laughs> of course. So, Artan, are you using um, MLflow for any of your projects uh, in your new role? Not recently, mostly because I'm more, more. My work is mostly like to figure out working. It's not. It doesn't have enough like parameters and artifacts that would MLflow would make it faster, more efficient. Usually MLflow comes handy when you're working with very like large number of simulations and you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we we are thinking of like a ML toolbox for campus. And so uh, we've been thinking of what are the tools that we need to have and make sure they work. And so we were talking of parallel PyTorch, which Enrique did some tutorials and then we're doing ray.io or something next semester. But ML flow is something that keeps coming over and over again. Yeah. And I feel I think you should also do one on AI inside inside these uh, like code editors because I've noticed both VS Code and Colab have include some AI clicks that you could just click on that and keep generate all the code for you. Or VS Code fixes all of your errors. But just click on that and it works beautifully. I, I recently used that in my collab with the Gemini and I was surprised. It saved me at least four hours because I did not know about that dependency hell. So it was PyTorch and something else that were fighting each other. So yeah, like cool. recently when I discovered that, like I don't I need to search Google or any of that anymore. Just click on that and fix it. I don't even need to know what's the error. Yeah, I I don't know how long before they start charging money for it. Right now, all seems to be free and happy, but I have a sinking oh. feeling that hap that uh, that is soon coming to an end. Well, I do have Copilot Pro, so but you say you have it without Copilot Pro. Yeah, I have uh, the Google uh, Colab, uh, the regular version. But I'm signed up for something in Google where they keep giving me all the new stuff uh, free for a long time now. Well, the one I was referring to, Google has one too. The one I was referring to was the VS Code Microsoft Copilot. Maybe okay. I can show that. I don't know if I have it here. Like, for example, when you try to run something. No, oh, I couldn't make MLflow work in my, <laughs> this is. Well, let's do something else. Oh, it has the generate, which is very nice, but also like, and then I want it, I want it to not work. How much is the VS Code uh, Pro version per month? Oh, the Copilot, I think it was $10 a month. I think I bought the annual one. 
you know, for academic, like for the whole university, that's so hard because they do it per person or they want to do it for the whole university. They are not very happy providing it like piecemeal. And that's the hard part about licensing. Oh, yeah. And trying to do it per person for the whole university is not easy. You can but imagine it's like the cost. It, it worked like a charm and then just fix it and run it. And this was a very simple thing. It worked for me for some a lot more complicated. Like when my database had empty cells, which happens in data science problems like all the time, it just figure out what module to load and take care of the empty cells and just fix it. So I've used the uh, Co code llama through a free plugin in uh, VS code and it was pretty decent. Um, I, I so... haven't used that yet. I just saw that a few days ago. For some reason, I didn't, I didn't see that. But the Amazon... and, uh, yeah, everybody's coming out with their code assistant. So this is, uh, we tried one a few months ago. I don't know, Michele, if you remember, or you guys, I yeah, posted that on our Slack where it was pretty easy to integrate our own uh, Word AI into my uh, VS code. And then it was really easy, just highlight much like, it, the interaction was identical and Code Llama is getting better and better. Yeah. So it's hard to keep up with this process. The like got disappeared. Thank you, uh, Artin, for doing this. And yeah, of I'm course. off to my nice. next one. Bye, everybody. Take care, Nira. Um, well, thank you for the discussion. And thank you for being here, folks. This was the end of the bioinformatics regular workshop. And I know that it might have been a little bit of a departure of just talking about bioinformatics. But you can see MLflow can really help if you are working with models, uh, especially larger ones. <clears throat> So thank you, Artin, for being here. And thank you very much for everyone's attention. Uh, well, and here. by the way, all these AI things that I just showed, if you have MLflow question, that works with those two. Like you can just ask it, oh, use MLflow to do this for me. It'll do it for you in Colab. So you can use Colab flow like an expert, you know? Oh, yes. Just pay the te extra $10 for VS Code Pro. Pull up as that too. That's free. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great uh, semester and I hope to see you around. Message us if you have any questions. You have my email address. And if you have any questions for Artin, uh, feel free to message me and I'll refer you to Artin's uh, email. So thank you.